joined by Luke Burgess to talk about Rene Girard's work. And Luke, you are familiar with Rebel Wisdom, so welcome. Thanks, David. Good to be with you. Yeah, and we were just talking a little bit before. I wonder, um, you've, you've seen a fair few bits of our pieces. How would you say that the... I mean, Girard has come up so many times in conversations that we've had, and it's been a kind of constant reference point, so it's really great to have you here to, to talk about it, and then we'll come to a few questions towards the end as well. Um, how would you say, why, why would you say that his work is significant? And in particular, why do you think, in wh what way do you think it overlaps with some of the other conversations we've hosted on the channel? I told my wife that I was going to be doing this uh, today and we, we talked about it last night and she said, oh, what's the name of the show? And I said, Rebel Wisdom. And we had this, we were at a dinner uh, with a few other people and we had this long conversation about the meaning of those words and what that means. And you know, in this very confusing, chaotic time that we live on, live in, who do we look to for wisdom? Where is wisdom to be found, right? Um, from a young age, I always looked at very traditional sources. I believed, you know, classic philosophy was probably a safer bet. Um, at least there weren't quite as many landmines there. Uh, and last night, as we were talking, this really interesting, we went down this rabbit hole, um, I recently was meditating on a story that's told in the Gospels of the, the lost sheep. So for those that don't know it, you know, Jesus says, you know, who among you, if, you know, a shepherd, if you have a hundred sheep and one goes wandering, wouldn't go after it. And I was reading some biblical commentary on that passage. Um, and I came to find out that there's actually a Gnostic Gospel of Thomas that has the same story. And in that particular uh, gospel, unlike the ones in, in the synoptic gospels, that sheep is portrayed as a rebel sheep that holds some kind of uh, special wisdom that the other sheep uh, don't know, right? Now, it didn't make it into the canon for a reason, but uh, that just sort of, that idea sort of fascinated me, right? This idea of the one in the 99 and the idea that throughout history, you know, important truths have been, you know, often in literature put on the mouths of clowns and court jesters and drunkards and, you know, people that society views as rebellious. And I think that um, Girard also realized that and where it really intersects with this work and the work that you're doing is key concept in Girard is that throughout history, the, there's been dangerous truths that have been covered up right, um, in terms of the, the nature of human violence and conflict. Um, you know, human beings have, have, you know, perennially chosen scapegoats uh, that have borne the, you know, the, the weight of their violence. And we never hear the, the, the truths that the scapegoats have to tell us, right, the, 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 wisdoms, the wisdom of the victim, in, in a sense. So there's, there's a lot of intersections. I mean, that's, that's one of them, um, you know, kind of uncovering um, a, 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 another side of, of, of history that we often, you know, don't, don't hear. And Girard himself was um, kind of a very, you know, re rebellious thinker. And I think that's part of why it's taken him so long to, to be accepted. So my introduction to Girard was um, kind of part of my, and I'd be happy to share the story, but it's sort of part of my own um, journey of trying to sort of figure out how to make sense of a chaotic world that I was living in and a very chaotic life at the time. Mm. Maybe let's start by framing just the basics of Girard. I mean, when I was researching this, I saw that he was called the, the Darwin of the human species, a new Darwin of the human species. Um, I guess the first question is a, a sort of very brief posit history maybe of, of, of him as a person, but why do you think his work is significant? Mm. So he was called the Darwin of the social sciences by his colleague, Michael Saris at, at Stanford. And Girard was fascinated by the way that Darwin thought, you know, the, the, the thought process of Darwin. You know, Darwin, like Girard, was sort of a hedgehog rather than a fox, right? You know, the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows one thing. So I think he saw some kindredness in, in Darwin. Um, you know, Darwin's idea, his big idea was very dynamic. Um, it was evolutionary. 
um, the, the, the thought evolved and kept building on itself over time, right? And was kind of a universal explanation of, um, you know, how we evolved, right, of, of, of biological evolution. Whereas Gerard is one of these grandiose thinkers that has this big idea that claims to have a, a fairly universal explanation for the formation of human culture and social life in the way that Darwin did with, with you know, bi biological with nature, right? Um, and I, I do think that Gerard is, is, will be seen as that important. It might just take a hundred years before that's the case. I, I, I still don't think very many people really know of Gerard's work. Um, just to backtrack a little bit for, for those that, that don't know a little bit about his life, Gerard was a Frenchman who came to the US shortly after World War II, started at Indiana University, um, bounced around to a bunch of different uh, universities and finally landed at Stanford. Um, his, his degree, his, his, his formal training was in history, but he, got, he was a real polymath and, and, he, and autodidact. So he threw himself into a bunch of different work. Uh, in the late 1950s, he was asked to teach a class on literature um, as a young uh, professor and you know, was hesitant to turn down any work at all. So he said, sure, I'll teach this class. And when he taught that class, he was trying to find some, some sort of structural principle that helped him understand the different pieces of literature that he was teaching, um, mostly you know, French, French literature, um, you know, French, French classics, Proust, um, Stendhal. Um, so he, it was sort of in the teaching of French literature outside of his domain of expertise that he made this discovery of mimetic desire, this idea that human desire is not uh, autonomous, uh, you know, sort of generated uh, ex nihilo out of nothing, but is in fact social, right? The, the fundamental structure of human desire, unlike um, animals, is, is social. You know, we look to other people to help show us what to want. And that initial sort of kernel, uh, that initial insight was something that he spent the rest of his life working out. You know, he, he had this insight that we've never really understood the fundamental nature of desire. And he said, it all sort of came to me at once. And I spent the rest of my life trying to understand what that means. What, you know, what, is, what are the implications of that if human desire is, is mimetic? Um, and he, he played it out. He spent the next five decades of his life thinking through what that actually meant. Okay, if we want the same things as other people, if, we, if our desire is somehow derived from other people, then might this lead to conflict? Might this lead to rivalry? Might this be the hidden source of human violence? And you know, anybody that knows mimetic theory knows that it's, it's, it's this very dense, um, multi-stepped process that I think starts with mimetic desire. But if you follow the thread all the way through, leads to really an explanation for, for human culture itself. And I think Girard is not very well appreciated because in a world in which content is king, right? Where, you know, if I can't pitch the importance of an idea to you in, you know, 20 to 30 seconds, like I'm on Shark Tank, then it doesn't have any value. Girard is really the opposite of that. You, you, in, in order to really understand him, You've got to sort of drop down into these ideas and, and sit with them for a while and understand the relationship, for instance, between human desire and sacrifice. There's an intimate relationship between desire and sacrifice, right? In order to get what we want, we, we usually sacrifice other things or sometimes even other people. And this to me, when I had that realization of how these things were all connected, it's when I realized, whoa, this is a thinker that I really need to spend some time with, right? I can't just read the book and go to a cocktail party and glibly explain this, this cool idea. This explains everything from part of why I think our culture is going crazy to why in my own life, I've bounced around and never seemed satisfied with anything that I've done because I keep chasing these illusory models. Um, and that's when I realized that this is, he, he's getting at, first principles of, of human behavior and what's more of a first principle than desire itself it's really at the root of everything mm. so what you, you just said it can explain why our culture culture is going crazy that's quite a quite a task but i'm gonna i'm gonna set you a 
uh, the job of trying to explain it. <laughs> I think in my, in, in Girard's view, um, if you accept the premise that human beings are mimetic creatures, right? Um, that we, we look to, we have a need to look to someone or something outside of ourselves to help us orient our desires, to help us order our desires would be a, a nice way to think about it, right? Um, now, the fundamental idea that there is an order to desire is disputed, right? Like, is there any order to desires at all? Um, is there, a, a, can desires be better or, or, or worsely ordered? Um, Gerard would say yes. And that throughout history, there have been certain models of desire that help orient human desire, right? The Ten Commandments are an example of that. They prohibit certain desires. Um, and they sort of guide, you know, they, they say what is desirable and, and what's not desirable, right? You could even argue that the last handful of commandments, and especially the 10th one, specifically prohibits a certain kind of um, horizontal desire that causes rivalry with our neighbors, right? Where we're looking to our right and our left, and, you know, we, we covet or we want what somebody else has, right? So this, this would be an example of, of a disordered desire that inevitably leads to conflict um, personal misery, and eventually violence, right? So Gerard realized that and that we look to, we, we, we need models as, as individuals and as a society to help order, order desires. Now, I, I would argue that in, you know, in the last, I mean, it's probably been happening for far more than you know, just the last handful of decades, but for quite some time now, a lot of traditional sort of models um, religious models, for instance, immediately come to mind, um, have really been superseded. And it's unclear to me, at least, who the new models are. And, you know, there, there does seem to be a lack of any kind of transcendent models, any kind of shared, you know, values. Um, and I think what that ends up leading to is a very sort of Girardian kind of nightmare, which is a war of all against all, where it's unclear Right, where it's sort of everybody chooses their own model. Um, everybody sort of views everybody else as a rival, but they, they have the wrong models. And this creates a, kind of a, you know, what Gerard would call a, a mimetic crisis, where, where, you know, everybody is confused about what is worth wanting. <laughs> Just fun fundamentally, like what, what is worth wanting? And I, I have one of the hats that I wear is, is as a professor and I teach college freshmen. And a lot of them, I think, are depressed because they can't, they, they can't name something that they even feel is desirable, right? They're, they're unclear about that, right? Other than satisfying kind of short-term passions and then realizing how empty that, that journey is. Um, they're they're sort of in a, they're, they're, they're paralyzed because they, they've, there's no solid object that, is, that they know is desirable that has been set before them. And I think that's a bit of a metaphor for much of the society. Um, I think a lot of the strange political things that are playing out, you know, not only in the US, but around the world um, stem from this very, this very problem where, you know, our, everybody's identity um, now is derived from their enemies or from what they're against, right? Or from, because um, there, there are no models of good. There are just models of bad. <laughs> and I, I, I see that just turning into it's kind of a nightmarish Hobbesian war of all against all, all against all. And frankly, I'm not quite sure, you know, how to solve that problem. Um, but that's, that's, you know, there's a whole scapegoating element to, to this too that I won't get into right now. But um, it does seem like we, a lot of the old methods that we use to solve our, our, our crises um, aren't really working anymore. And is this the, the sense that we don't have a, a lodestar? It's kind of the death of religion and the death of an ideal in the culture. I remember Douglas Murray said something very succinct that I thought was very smart, where he said, we may be the first people in human history not to have an overarching story of why we are doing what we're doing. Like we have no, no, no overall narrative that we're following 
together. Is that the same the same observation, or is this slightly different from a Girardian perspective? I think that that is that that is definitely part of it, right? It's I mean one of the ways that you could sort of define postmodernity is um, a breakdown and an absence of any kind of meta meta narrative, right? Um, everybody just has their their own narrative, and it doesn't seem to be a shared narrative. We lack shared experiences um, uh, more in the last two and a half years than ever before. You know, as as the world has went more and more virtual, um, and now you see, you know, basic. Um, there's so much doubt and skepticism, um, even in our own experiences, right? Like nobody, uh, there seems to be a loss of trust even in ourselves and in our, in, in our own experiences, where you know you have um, a, a movement where people doubt whether they're they're even real, right? This is part of I, I think the. I wouldn't say necessarily the transhumanist movement, but the post-humanist movement, where you know you have prominent people online saying, "How do I know that I'm not, you know, a character in a video game or something like that?" Right? And it's mm -hmm. it's you know that that I think expresses the the level of skepticism and doubt, which is a result of this sort of loss of belief in any kind of 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 narrative that binds us together as as a as as a human family, right? Mm -hmm. And so much of Gerard's work um, is a, a tracing out throughout history of the perennial problems that, that, that we've had, right? That we, we tend to resort to certain very specific kinds of scapegoating violence. Um, but how do you understand that if, if, if you don't accept um, that, that, shared, that shared history that we're all a part of, right? You, sort, you can exempt yourself from that and not mm -hmm. realize that you're, that you're something in your nature is, 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 has been part of that or tends towards the same thing that he's describing. Yeah, and I guess if people have heard of Girard, a lot of it is because of Peter Thiel famously is a, is a huge fan of Girard and says that he uses it or used it to, to make a lot of his investments in Silicon Valley. Is that, what, what is the connection with, with Thiel? And do you think that's the main reason people have heard of him? It's not how I heard of him. Um, I, I think that Teal's role in propagating the ideas and and and, and making Gerard known is is over exaggerated. You know, it certainly wasn't a bad thing for Gerard's recognition to have um, a famous student who went on to to you know found uh, several very valuable companies and 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 you know has sort of become. Um, a, a very public figure and, and talks a lot about Gerard. I mean, that certainly wasn't a bad thing, but I think that there's a lot of different entry points into Gerard, and Peter. That one one of them is to sort of think of mimetic desire and mimesis as um, on sort of a superficial level as something that you can use to help make better investment decisions. Or something like that, right? Um, it was the challenge for me in, in trying to get a publisher to understand the importance of a book on Rene Girard, where I don't think his thought lends itself very well to short pitches. But I I, I had to sell this idea, knowing that they were only going to read my proposal for maybe two minutes or less. So what did I do to, to sell the idea? I said, hey, um, you know, Peter Thiel said that the reason he knew to make the investment in Facebook was his understanding of mimetic desire, and he saw Facebook as this mimetic machine that would accelerate mimetic desire. I just got their attention that way, right? That was just my hook. Um, so I played that I played that game. But I think it's a shame to stop to stop there because for me, the far more interesting part of Girard is is the explanatory power of human culture, of conflict, of rivalry, of the scapegoating um, machine that seems to be our culture. Like we seem to have an insatiable need. Um, to, to, to transfer blame uh, to certain individuals or to, or to certain groups. I think Gerard explains that uh, in a very powerful way. Um, and it's kind of scary when you see that tendency even in yourself. Um, so my journey to Gerard was a, very, was a very personal one. It wasn't actually that intellectual. It was more helping me understand why I, I moved from one thing to another only to find myself sort of stuck in this pattern, the cycle of very unfulfilling mimetic desire. And I didn't realize that I just kept swapping out my models of desire for new ones. And at mm -hmm. no point took the time to understand what was really going on 
at a at a personal I, I would say almost a spiritual level like getting to know myself and and you know the difference between my false self and my my true self yeah that that you, you, that's a great segue because that was one of the questions that came up as I was thinking about this conversation is this question of what we want what we desire and the the journey that we go on to discover our true desires well whether our desires are implanted by our parents or by our culture or by just what we're sort of seeing everyone else doing feels like a process of individuation it feels like a, a spirit you, you called it a spiritual process mm. did did Gerard see it in that way and did do you think that that's a helpful helpful way of looking at the dynamic of mimetic desire it is for me, um, and it's Gerard didn't talk about the spiritual dimension um, a lot, um, but it's that's that's been the lens through which I've understood it at the deepest level. Um, so one way to think about it, or here, here's a realization that I had, sort of, of the relationship between desire and uh, and sacrifice, and the difference between the false self and the true self. And I think Thomas Merton, by the way, has some of the the best writing on this, especially in New Seeds of Contemplation, where he talks about this illusory self, which is really the product of egotistical de desires, right? Where the whole world is ordered around my egotistical personal desires. And I don't recognize as anybody else is having desires of their own. So when my, when my egotistical desires be take primacy, right? And I believe that that what I want is, is I wanted first, I wanted before you, I wanted before anybody else, and that they're mine, that they're just a product of my uh, autonomous, it's who I am, right? Then um, if I really believe that, then inevitably my desires are gonna come into conflict with other people's. Mm -hmm. And then something has to give, right? Like this is, you know, and, and religious traditions have typically called this kind of desire mm -hmm. sin. Right. I mean, I think the easiest definition of sin is disorder desire or the kind of desire that causes me to have to do violence to another person to sacrifice something in order to get what I want. That's just very simple. And I I realized that I, I had done that in, in my own life. Right. So I was, you know, startup founder and an entrepreneur. And it's it's a very popular saying to say, like, you have to be able to make sacrifices to get what you want. Right. To build the company that you want. And there's a real dark side to that when my desires and what I want, which could be completely illusory and egotistical and prideful, um, begin to sort of warp the way that I see everything around me, you begin to use people, you begin to sacrifice people. Um, that, that was a startling sort of realization. And I think this is a fundamental point in Girard. And I didn't really see any way out of that other than kind of a spiritual way, right? Because we're, we're dealing with pride. Um, and in, in sort of one of my ways to get out of that cycle that I was in um, was one of the most mimetic things of all that I did, which was, you know, I read a biography of Francis of Assisi. I've never told this story. I read a biography of Francis of Assisi, who, you know, the son of a wealthy cloth merchant who, you know, famously goes out and strips naked out in the town square in the town of Assisi and renounces all of his wealth, right? And Shortly after I, I, you know, come upon his story, I did my own version of this. Right? I, did, I did my own version of, of walking away from everything, renouncing everything that I had built. Um, and, and, and what I didn't realize at the time was that, first of all, this was a highly mimetic thing that I did, um, probably born more from pride than anything else. Um, all the while thinking about how heroic, you know, this, this thing that I was doing was, right? And then it just took me a long while to sort of work through that and realize kind of the spiritual disease that was at the heart of it. So, you know, I'm, I'm a religious person. Um, so I, I, I do see it in that lens, but I think there's a lot of value in Gerard. Um, even if you just look at, cause he, he, he approaches this for, on the level of just basic human anthropology, right? Human beings are desiring creatures, right? So that is a, is, is, is just a fundamental premise and whether, you want to take the theological perspective on where that desire comes from and where it's leading and relate it to, to the spiritual life and sacrificial love and, and all of these things. Um, you can do that, or you can just sort of start with, okay, 
I'm a, I'm a desiring creature. And what do I do about that? Right. And there are different schools of thought on that. Right. Some say that desire um, is, is the cause of suffering, right? And that the, the, the goal should be to eliminate desire, but different spiritual traditions have different, have different ways of addressing the fundamental question of desire, what it is and what it's for and where it's going. Mm. And that is a really good place to start. I would say the question of desire is at the heart of every religion. Mm. Yeah, and I guess the... The Buddhists talk about renouncing desire fundamentally, um, and the Christians have a slightly sort of more warped relationship with it because they prescribe certain desires and and uh, accept others. Um, moving on to the the scapegoat idea, because you mentioned that and how deceptively deep a concept that is, um, I'd love to I'd love if you can kind of summarize that that perspective and then I, I wonder whether you feel whether that came online particularly during the pandemic there was there was sort of this sense of of really intense passions and a lot of people talked about sort of Girardian uh, dynamic that was playing out during the pandemic on 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 all sides hmm. so the scapegoat mechanism is a is a fundamental part of mimetic theory and it's Gerard's explanation for how human beings throughout history have solved a mimetic crisis. Now, what's a mimetic crisis? It's where there's a real loss of, um, there's a loss of, there's, there's general confusion about who's, uh, which models to follow, right? Um, people begin to sort of take one another as, as rivals. And there is this sort of uh, war of all against all of competing desires, okay? Um, competing desires and a, a, a war of desire. And the way that, and, and, and sort of in, an, in a, a, a closed community, there's no, it just continues to escalate and fester and fester until one of two things happen. Either there's sort of a renunciation of the rivalrous desire right? The competition of desires. And it goes back to what I was describing before, right? Where if I believe in this primacy of my own desire, then I will inevitably come to view others as rivals and enemies. And there, there is a will to power sort of Nietzschean uh, dynamic to all of this, right? That comes into play. Either a, a renunciation happens, which almost never happens, by the way. And, and if that doesn't happen, then how how is this mimetic uh, crisis averted so that everybody doesn't just destroy everybody else. Well, Gerard said that a, a person or a group is identified that where people that, that allows people to mimetically unite around them and place all of the all of the blame uh, onto that person or that group and expel them, kill them, um, just just blame them so that we don't actually have to deal with the very conflicted, complex causes of our own desires, right? We just say that's that person uh, is the reason that we're in such a mess right now. And then collectively, you know, people come together and, and blame them. And there's ancient rituals that, you know, all sort of, there's very symbolic things, right? Like on, in ancient Israel, there was a, 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 there was a goat where all the sins of the people were symbolically transferred onto this goat and the goat was driven out into the wilderness. So Gerard said that, well, this, this, that's a symbol for something that just constantly perennial happen, perennially happens uh, in society and in coming together and uniting around the scapegoat, which is a mimetic process, by the way, that happens through mimesis. We unite um, for a short period of time. There's a feeling of catharsis um, as we come together. And we, we're under the illusion that we've solved some fundamental problem when in fact we haven't because there's some temporary peace and within a short period of time, we have to go look for another scapegoat. During the pandemic, I think we had, a, we had something completely unexpected um, shake our entire world. And The, the fundamental crisis that resulted from, from the 
from COVID-19 was a social one. I, I, I think that it was it, it fundamentally, it's a social one, or at least the one that will last longer than the epidemiological crisis, right? Is the, is the social crisis that resulted from that. I think we're still sort of, it seems like we've forgotten, at least in my part of the world, forgotten very quickly um, about the pandemic. Um, my dad has COVID, so I certainly haven't uh, right now. Um, and it's, it, it seems as if it, there was a, a sort of breakdown in our ability to, I mean, there, there was a, there was, there were competing, there were competing desires and it, it just became very unclear um, who was going to be, who we were going to be able to blame for this, right? It seemed like none of the scapegoats that we chose worked. Um, the virus itself, if it dies and if it just, if it went away immediately, um, would provide no kind of catharsis because we can't see it. It's, there's nothing, um, we're, it, I think that's sort of part of the cause of the crisis is that we, this, this social crisis was inflicted on us and we had no idea none of the traditional scapegoats worked. And I, one of the most fascinating passages, I think in all of literature is at the end of Crime and Punishment where Raskilnikov has this dream of some, he literally says some plague that comes out of the depths of Asia that causes um, a, a social crisis where nobody knows who to trust anymore. So he's, you know, Dostoevsky is writing this back in the late 1800s. And when Gerard's looking at that passage, he basically is saying that Dostoevsky is describing a mimetic crisis that is going to need some kind of a scapegoat. Um, and it doesn't seem like we've, like we've found one and I'm not quite sure how much longer you know, we, we, we can go. I mean, it's just, it's just shifted into other things now. And we, it doesn't seem like we've actually got to the root of the problem. Mm. There was a, one of the people we've had on the channel before, Mary Harrington was saying that in the UK, at least Boris Johnson is our scapegoat, that he's kind of taking the, as a, in the, in the aftermath of the pandemic, partly because of the, the parties they were having in 10 Downing Street, and he certainly has earned his role as the, as the scapegoat, but just the level of antipathy and the level of kind of hatred that was being put onto him was kind of almost out of, out of um, scale with, with, with what was deserved. And it was almost like now the pandemic is over, he's, I think she called him our sin eater, the idea that Boris is our sin eater, which I think is a, which is a um, kind of maybe a, an old British term for the same thing in terms of the scapegoat. Um, yeah. Guy had a couple of good questions in the in the chat. One, I'll ask Guy to unmute himself and ask one in a second. But you mentioned the renunciation of desire. You you said that was very rare. Do you has that happened? Do you know any examples of where that has happened, rather than the scapegoat dynamic? Well, not the renunciation of desire, but the renunciation of, of the, the kind of rivalrous, selfish de desire, right, that leads to the conflict and, and the inevitable violence. Um, so, you know, I think that certainly, you know, the, the, the message of the entire message of Christianity is, is to renounce that kind of, of violence, right? I mean, like when they come to take Jesus away, they cut off the ears, put your sword back in your scabbard, right? Because that there, we could, the, the fundamental lie at the heart of the scapegoat mechanism, according to Girard, is the human belief that violence can drive out violence, period. That some targeted violence can, can eliminate violence, whereas the, 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 the micro violence just always leads to more and more violence because violence itself is mimetic. So we, we typically try to solve the problem with, with some kind of targeted violence. Um, and that's, that's the fundamental kind of lie. So, you know, I, I think that there are millions of small examples that we probably never heard of, um, you know, of people renouncing the desire for revenge or vengeance or something like that. Um, and it's a shame because what's amplified in our world um, are, are, is the opposite, right? And we don't hear enough of those, of those kinds of beautiful stories, but I, I think they happen all the time. And would Gandhi be a, an example of that as well, maybe? I think Gandhi is, is um, one of the best examples of an anti-mimetic person and, and, and disposition. You know, that stance of, of, of nonviolence, um, incredibly rare. Um, and, and that's, you know, the name of my newsletter is called Anti-Mimetic because I'm fascinated 
by those kinds of people that are not contrarians, right? That the meaning of this term anti-memetic is not just to be a contrarian, because in fact, to be a contrarian can just be an incredibly memetic thing, right? Um, you want X, I want Y, right? This kind of, um, you know, negative partisanship in politics, right? It's like, if you want something, if you think something's good, then I, I can't, I have to think that the opposite thing is, is that's what I need to go for. An anti-memetic disposition, which I think Gandhi really embodied, is to sort of step outside of that and to renounce um, the desire to be pulled into memetic games. And one of the things that I see all over the place are people are, this is what a troll does, right? A troll is, is an expert memetic baiter, right? A troll baits people into a memetic response to something. And very few people have the anti-memetic, you know, machinery, if you will, to be able to resist the temptation to, to strike back, which, you know, is sort of an infinite game, right? Where, do, where does that, where does that end? Especially when we're talking digital stuff. Mm. Can you just describe what you mean by memetic response in that context? Um, a memetic response is, um, is, a, is a response to aggression with aggression or, or a um, responding in kind would be one way right. to think about it, right? So the, def the memetic simply means imitation, right? It's imitative Go behavior. Ahead. So responding in kind, it doesn't mean non-response necessarily, but it means not responding in kind. So to step back and, and say, you know, name calling is a very sort of childish example of this, right? But like when somebody sort of uh, takes some action towards us, our action need not be determined by, by what they did, right? We can respond, but respond in an anti-memetic way it means not to imitate them in any way. Gotcha. Yeah, that's... So the troll is effectively trying to create uh, a response that is in the same tone as the trollish behavior itself. And it's the, the better the troll is, the better they are at actually controlling your response. I, I mean, a troll, it's, it's incredibly, uh, you know, the troll is incredibly powerful when they know that they can get other people to respond in the way that they want them to respond. And that's, yeah. in, in fact, they, they take great delight and great satisfaction in that. So the only way to combat that is to simply not respond in, in the way that they're, they would predict that you would respond. Mm. It's funny, I, it's interesting, until you framed it that way, I'd not really seen trolling as a power move. I'd seen it as kind of disruptive or um, sociopathic, but not so much as a power move. But when you frame it that way, it's actually a way of controlling other people. Absolutely. That's really interesting. Um, Guy, you've had a few really good questions in the chat. Did you want to ask one to, to Luke? Yeah, thanks, David. Hi, Luke. Um, yeah, I've, I've got this theory. I don't know if I'm misunderstanding Girard, but um, I've got this fit, this theory that um, that we our culture is creating um, unconsciously creating um, sacrificial scapegoats constantly. So, for example, um, for me, a good example seems to be uh, what happened with Princess Diana in the UK. That she was um, people often don't remember this part, but she was vilified after she basically disconnected from the royal family. And then the tabloid newspaper sort of went after her. And um, she actually ended up dying in, in this process of like being chased by the tabloid newspapers. Um, and then as soon as, as soon as she was dead, it was like that we've made the sacrifice and it's kind of, she's now become like, um, you know, the princess again, in fact, even much. Oh, oh, I think you cut, you cut out on me, Guy. We've lost Guy. Let's wait for him to come back. You can, you can maybe riff off that. I was just thinking as Guy was speaking, Amy Winehouse is another good example of that. The Britain in particular um, does seem to have this dynamic of, particularly with the tabloid press, of hounding people once they've become famous. And I wonder, yeah, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on the Diana case, mm -hmm. but maybe I'll, I'll, there also seems to be something about British culture in particular, but some other cultures about cutting people down to size that feels like a kind of example of the of the same kind of scapegoat dynamic. I'm kind of wondering how that fits. Yeah, um, kind of a sh Schadenfreude. Um, is Guy back? 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the guy I think is is back. Hey, guy, you you're back. So, so Zoom chose the absolute worst moment to just suddenly quit. <laughs> we got to Princess Diana guy, and um, whether that's a dynamic of the scapegoat. Yeah. It's, so that so the question is basically is is there a kind of unconscious process in the culture which is if you can't consciously choose a scapegoat and kill them. Does it happen anyway unconsciously um, through kind of, let's say, a, a sort of Jungian process of like the unconscious um, carrying out that without any conscious um, uh, people admitting that is happening? It's a great, um, it's a great question. And, and I think observation about Princess Diana. Um, I've heard the, the, the media and the paparazzi in the UK is way worse even than in the US. I, I've heard that. I don't know if that's true, but I, I think it. I think it probably is. Um, well, Gerard would say that the, the the scapegoat is never intentionally chosen. It's it always happens through an unconscious process, and that in fact, if it's if it's not unconscious, it doesn't work because it, it's premised on a kind of uh, a, a lie or distortion of the truth that the scapegoat is actually like actually bears more more blame than he or she does. So there, there's a there's a parallel to Darwin here. You know, you'd asked about Darwin and the analogy. You know, Gerard the Darwin of the social sciences. The analogy is to natural selection. What's the difference between natural selection and artificial selection? Well, in artificial selection, um, there's some intentional process of selection, and in natural selection, um, it's unintentional, um, unconscious. It's just a process that happens. So you could think of Darwin's theory of natural selection and evolution as nature being some kind of giant um, uh, scapegoating um, or, or sacrificial, sorry, sacrificial machine, right? Where certain certain creatures have to be sacrificed sort of in order for the evolution of, of, of the others. There's some analogy there to, to, I think, what Gerard is saying plays out in human social life and, and human culture. But it has to be unconscious. A key part of Gerard's theory is that the scapegoating process is unconscious. I think that it was with 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 Princess Di. And another part of 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 this is there's the the, the scapegoat after the scapegoat is is eliminated, expelled, dies, um, is is tradi traditionally takes on a mystique, or, or traditionally takes on some kind of Gerard would even say sacred kind of power. Because in the elimination of the scapegoat, um, the people that were that were caught up in that process, um, be, uh, they've they've sort of lost their reason for for being. With it's the end, it's the end of a of a certain process. So the figure that was scapegoated is transformed in their in their death or in their. In, in being expelled into something different and comes to symbolize something something different. Um, so I just finished reading a, a fantastic book by Dana Joya called The Subversive History of Music. And he talks about how like many, many famous uh, bands, you know, think Kurt Cobain with Nirvana, um, think a lot, a lot of these famous bands in the 60s, 70s, there was some sacrificial figure, some lead singer or something like that. It was very highly troubled that would would die either from an OD or from suicide. And then after the death was somehow almost deified or glorified or took on some some mystique. You know, it's just a pattern that continues to, to, to play out of figures who during their lifetime, while they're sort of part of this process, um, don't have that kind of mystique or that kind of power. It's only after their death. Um, and, I, and that's been a constant throughout history in all of the different incidences of the scapegoat that Gerard studied. And in fact, many cultures have a myth about a scapegoating process that, that results in creating a new God. And that, and that this is kind of the basis of a lot of religious, uh, religious life. Yeah, yeah when, when I say um, unconsciously, I meant it kind of um, contrasted to something like Aztec culture where they would mm -hmm. consciously choose somebody and kill them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that they have, but maybe that's just not Girardi and maybe that's just simply like, we're going to consciously choose a scapegoat and just murder them, you know? Um, so maybe that's not strictly Girardi. 
Well, so I think even in Aztec culture, um, you know, the it's the it's the the process of like certainly even in Aztec culture, they they Gerard would say that they didn't realize the scapegoat mechanism that they were caught up in, right? They they didn't that that part of it was certainly unconscious. And the choosing of the scapegoat what was in some sense um was a was a mimetic process and a mimetic process is different than a rational process so um some somebody may have made some choice of who to sacrifice but for to get uh sort of unanimity around that um not everybody th there there had to have been some kind of mimetic cascade that that was not perfectly rational right so so mimesis can be, that comes into tension with rationality and that it, it wouldn't work or at least get a community involvement without a mimetic process that wasn't entirely rational. And the question of how a scapegoat is chosen is a fascinating one. Um, you know, and, and one, one way to be chosen as a scapegoat is simply to stand out too much, to get noticed. And that is part of, I think, what happens with this idea of cutting people down to size. You know, people are just noticed too much. Um, no matter what they're saying, it tends to just attract attention to themselves. And that attention always runs the risk, according to Girard, of turning, of turning negative. So, you know, it's, it's it, one of his famous sayings was, you know, we don't elect um, presidents or leaders, we just elect future scapegoats. Because even attention that is initially positive um, has just sort of put somebody on a pedestal that makes it when the time comes to find somebody to blame, it just makes it easier to to choose them. Really, was there any sense with Gerard's thought that there that this was a process that we might grow out of, or that this was a process of kind of evolution of of humans, or does he think it's eternal and and kind of baked into the humans the the kind of human psyche? he the, the way to grow out of it is 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 renunciation and forgiveness right so this is why the the this is why christianity had such a huge role to play in, in gerard's theory right he said that is the only way according to gerard that's the only way out right is you know it, it, towards the end of one of his his book on the scapegoat he said um the time to forgive one another is now and time is running out right so that that idea of forgiveness of of not returning violence for violence is the only way out of the cycle. And because the violence, aggression, these things are highly mimetic behaviors. There are a few things more mimetic than, than aggression. Um, there's been studies that have shown online that um, it seems like anger spreads much faster than positive emotions like empathy or joy. Right? When somebody is angry online, it, it seems to be more mimetic than, than positive things. So this is sort of fundamental to, to, to human behavior to understand that the mimetic response, the thinking that violence will somehow solve the problem of violence is what he calls a, a satanic principle basically. And that the only way, the only way out of that scapegoating, um, thinking that scapegoating is the solution is, is just a renunciation. And other than that, he didn't really propose, you know, there's no technological solution. Um, it's certain he didn't propose one. Um, so it, you know, it, he just said we have a, a fairly binary choice to make. That's Gerard's view. So he was a he was sort of a, a evangelical Christian, or became so towards the end of his life. Um, Gerard was a Roman Catholic, actually, um, and he didn't. I think he sort of played down that that aspect because it doesn't really go over. I mean, being religious in general doesn't go over very well in the academy. Um, but it's it's very difficult to fully understand Gerard without understanding the kind of uh, religious implications of some of the things that he was saying. And do people, are there some people who actually embrace and look for that role of scapegoat? I've kind of noticed sort of martyr complexes sometimes in some people. Um, is that something people can consciously step into or even subconsciously step into? So the, you mean playing, playing the victim in essence, like be, becoming yeah. a scapegoat? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And 
Gerard, Gerard's view was that nobody has greater power today than somebody that can claim victim status. And in fact, there's almost a mimetic rivalry um, for who, who has the best claim to being a victim. Um, because the, 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 they, they are able to, to um, best way to say this, um, because the scapegoat mechanism has been revealed in a sense, um, partly through the biblical revelation, the scapegoat mechanism doesn't, doesn't work the way that it used to. People, people the, 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 the innocence of the victim has been exposed, right? Whereas throughout human history, the, the, the people that were sacrificed as scapegoats were always assumed to be guilty of some crime, right? All myth, like the, all, always. And now for the first time in human history, we, it's sort of universal value to protect victims and to protect innocent victims, which is obviously a good thing. But like any good thing, um, when you, you, when the victim is, has become the supreme value of a culture, people will inevitably ab abuse that and sort of use victimhood as a, as a form of power. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, straight out of uh, Gerard's book called I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. Um, he's got a great quote that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's uh, victims now are, are the ones that can create new scapegoats and do violence against other people um, and not be called out for it, basically. Because there's, there's, they've sort of claimed a mantle where they're, they're, they're not held to the same standards. Is, when, did, when did Gerard die? 2015. Because mm. you've got this very interesting dynamic in modern culture, as you pointed to, where you've got the kind of weird conflation of both parts of Girard's obsession. Like the scapegoat has become an attractive identity. So in a way, you've got now the mimetic desire to become a scapegoat. And he lived long enough to see that start to, to be born, did he? He did. He did. And you know, towards the, the last 10 years of his life, he wasn't in great health. So he didn't speak a lot. He didn't write a lot. Um, he wasn't writing or commenting really on um, after the birth of social media, for instance. Um, but I would have loved to have, to have seen what, what he had to say about that or, or to listen to him talk about that. But he, he, already saw, he already saw the dynamic playing out though, in terms of this inversion almost um, of the scapegoat mechanism. Right, a, a weird, a weird inversion of it, and um, it's almost like the scapegoat mechanism. I mean, the, the title of his, his magnum opus is "Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World," and what's the thing hidden since the foundation of the world? It's the scapegoat mechanism. That's it. It's it's the fact that human beings it's uh, constantly scapegoat other people, but it's not really hidden since the foundation of the world anymore because now here we are, here we are having a conversation about it. So, you know, something has changed in the last several decades. And now because that knowledge is no longer hidden, it can be used, right? It can be used by people with intentionality. And that is a really weird new dynamic that has been introduced. You know, I, I see that playing out on social media um, where we have this new knowledge of, of human behavior and people are sort of attempting to take advantage of it. Mm. And um, what do you think he would have made of social media? I think that he would have been very um, ambivalent about it. Um, I once heard Gerard described as, as one of the most ambivalent people in the world because he would have seen, he sort of saw two sides to, to everything. Um, he would have seen social media and the internet in general as a good thing because it diffuses mimetic desire in a billion different different ways and, and places. And um, you know, people can get into a little uh, disagreement on Twitter and they're probably not gonna walk out in the street and have a duel with guns or swords or something like that. So you know, if you take like the long-term view, social media has given us outlets for all kinds of mimetic, the, the playing out of mimetic desire and mimetic rivalry in relatively non-dangerous ways. Uh, in the big scheme of things, if you're talking about literal uh, violence. Um, 
Um, on the other, so in, in a sense that we, we, in human beings sort of need ways to diffuse mimetic desire. You'd probably say um, that market economies are a way um, to, to positively channel mimetic desire, for instance. Um, there's sort of competition and rivalry um, propels people to, to innovate and create new things. And there's sort of some positive outcome from mimetic desire. So mimetic desire is not a bad thing, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's just the way that we are. Um, and there are bad outcomes and there are good outcomes. So I think you would see some positive aspects of technology in general and social media to do that. But of course, he would see that it's, you know, he would see what it's led to in terms of um, the horrible things that have happened to people that have become within five to 10 minutes. You know, this is unprecedented, really. You have people from all over the world Mm. coalescing and, 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 and blaming the same, and in some cases, ruining their career, ruining their life. Um, you know, it's driven some people to suicide. And, you know, he would see this as the latest sickness manifestation of the scapegoat mechanism, but a very sort of pathetic um, and ineffectual form of it. Um, and it is, it's ineffectual because it just, the, the scapegoats that, that are created on social media, um, create a temporary piece that sometimes lasts for a matter of seconds or a matter of minutes. Um, and then there needs to be a new one. And this is the, this is the 24 hour news cycle. Um, this is what we, you know, what we see on, as, as we scroll our feeds every day, it's just this non nonstop need to transfer blame. And it's easier than ever before with the, with the tools that we have. Mm. Always good to end on a positive note like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah gerard gerard was dark i have to say um he's he's he was not um he was very apocalyptic near the end of his life especially um you know the title of his last book that he wrote before he died is called battling to the end and it's it's where he sort of really urged humanity to to sort of see scapegoating violence for what it is and to understand this mimetic mechanism that is at work inside of us and to and to deal with it um, and mm -hmm. to confront it on, honestly and truthfully, and to renounce desires when they when they are um, they are conflictual. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you know certainly um, at least in my work and in my book, I, I think there's a lot of hope here. Um, mm -hmm. So to end on a, to end on a positive note, and mimetic desire is not a negative. It's not a bad thing. Um, it's it's what makes us fundamentally human. You know, we're social creatures. Mimetic desire is is allows us to transcend ourselves and to to look to others, to be concerned with what others want, um, and to enter into relationships with other people. So mimetic desire is about our relationships with, with other people. And some of the most beautiful things in life are, are positively mimetic. Love in itself can be um, positively mimetic, right? Re reciprocal love, right, between two people. Um, and there's, there's so much to be said with that. And, and the, the whole key here is not to necessarily just renounce, but to transform, right? To, to transform the rivalrous, conflictual, zero-sum uh, idea of desire into a kind of um, positively reciprocal, transcendent form of desire where we're actually helping one another to, to, to want more um, and to desire. And, and if we're going to sacrifice, um, not to sacrifice other people for what we want, but perhaps to sacrifice um, some of our illusory false desires in order to enter into healthier relationships with other people. Luke, thank you so much for, for your time and for laying that out so clearly and, um, and for, for giving us a little bit of a positive note at the end. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me, David. I, I really appreciated it.